This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. And even if one side wins, Sudan will lose. Kenya's government is being blamed by survivors of more than 90 people who starved themselves to death. Global health groups are trying to vaccinate millions of children who missed out during the pandemic. These stories and more on African News tonight. But first, our top story. Noraldine Sati, who served as Sudan's envoy to the U.S. from 2020 until 2022, says the temporary U.S. brokered ceasefire is holding despite reports of patchy gunfire across the country. Sati says there's a need for international pressure on the leaders of the military and the paramilitary rapid support forces to talk peace. He says the conflict could spiral out of control with more actors joining in for their national interests. People are fleeing all over the place, uh, leaving Khartoum. Uh, The two belligerents are systematically uh, destroying the capital, looting houses, killing people, maiming people. Uh, it's really an unthinkable what's happening in, in Khartoum now. And, and, and elsewhere, of course, you know, in some uh, cities in Darfur, the same kind of thing is happening. Um, you know, the war now is being extended you know, outside uh, to Khartoum, to the fringes of the capital to the Jazeera province, to the north of Khartoum, to the west of Khartoum. And uh, I think the two sides want to, to go to the finish, you know. That, that's, that, that seems to be there. They think, uh, each and every one thinks that they can, they can win this war. But we know they will only destroy the country and no winner will clearly emerge from it. And uh, continued chaos and lawlessness will prevail. And let's talk about the latest information that we got today, that uh, several prisons were attacked, and uh, specifically the prison where President Bashir, former President Omar al-Bashir was, and some of his uh, close associates uh, was also attacked. And this uh, speaks to the fact that um, the the, the loyalists of Bashir are now out and about in the mix. What is the implication of this latest development? The implication of this development is that they are going to continue fanning the fire and they will uh, do their best to, to, to contribute to this chaos uh, and to further uh, escalate the war. Uh, they made a statement, actually, and I'm sure probably that you have seen it by Ahmed Harun, who claims to represent them, saying that we are out here and we are going to uh, repel and the rebellion. We are going to uh, resist the rebellion and you know finish this rebellion, meaning the RSF. And um, g- give me some context about Ahmed Harun. He was a former governor and he was indicted by ICC. Give me some context. Yes, Ahmed Harun was a former governor of uh, North uh, Kordofan, uh, based in Lubarid at the time, and he is the one who made uh, very controversial statements at the time about uh, exterminating the, the rebels and killing them and all that. Uh, and he uh, was very close to Bashir, and, and he's accused, of course, of, of having contributed to mass killings uh, in Darfur and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, indicted by the IS, ICC, and he's one of those, you know, on the list of the former president and others. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, uh, uh, arrested and, and detained in cover uh, prison until, until yesterday. And there are growing, uh, you know, there are reports of growing calls for from people who are concerned, uh, asking the international community to put pressure on the two parties to silence the guns and chat a way forward for negotiations or dialogue. Talk to me about your experience on this front. Yes, there are calls, um, the last of which, of course, was the Security Council meeting yesterday. The calls from uh, the Sudanese uh, themselves, of course, uh, and many other friends of Sudan uh, to put pressure on the two, uh, you know, belligerents. But, of course, uh, what kind of pressure is going to be effective uh, effective in these circumstances? Um, Well, at least now we have 
uh, seemingly we have a, a kind of uh, a lull in the fighting for three days uh, um, that uh, a kind of a truce has been negotiated by the Americans and by uh, some of the Sudanese civil society leaders. Uh, and we hope that is going to continue to hold. Uh, there is sporadic uh, fighting, uh, you know, here and there, but uh, in the main, it seems to be holding. Um, of course, uh, what uh, we are hoping is that this uh, ceasefire is going to be consolidated, maintained and consolidated and extended to a further period of time. And then in the meantime, uh, talks will start, uh, not only between the two belligerents, but also involving the civilians, so as to see what course of action can be taken in order to resume the, the transition in Sudan. And you were here uh, representing the transitional government there on a civilian ticket. I mean, you came during uh, pr former Prime Minister Hamdok's tenure in office. Now you're still here. What are you telling the U.S. government officials about the situation in Sudan, about what they should do, about how it can be de-escalated? Well, um, I'm telling them exactly what I, I just said, you know, I mean, in touch with, uh, uh, you know, uh, officials in, in, the, in the administration, and I'm talking to them about the situation. Uh, and the message that I'm passing is that we, uh, the Sudanese are expecting uh, the role uh, of the U.S. As, as a leader of the international community to continue its pressure on the two uh, belligerence in order to stop the war, that the first priority. The second priority is to uh, do everything possible in order to stabilize the situation uh, and, uh, and come to the rescue of the Sudanese people, because the humanitarian the situation, as you know, is, is really catastrophic. It's, it's really dire. Nur al-Din Sati, Sudan's former ambassador to the United States, speaking with VOA's John Tanza. While people in Sudan and United Nations officials say the 72-hour ceasefire the two sides have called is holding, there are reports of sporadic fighting. And UN officials say there appears to be no sign the two generals are willing to negotiate an end to the fighting, which has left hundreds of civilians dead, forced tens of thousands to flee their homes, and halted supplies of necessities, including food, water, and medicine. Ongoing violence between the Sudanese army and the Rapid Support Forces, RSF, has raised concerns about the possible impact for Libya, both on politics and the country's fragile security situation. Observers are particularly concerned about the issue of foreign fighters and mercenaries in Libya, many of whom have strong links to Sudan in the event that the conflict becomes protracted. Wolfgang Postai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, discussed with VOA senior analyst Mohamed al shanawi how the war in Sudan could affect Libya. Several people in Libya are very nervous about the developments in Sudan, and they need to be. The Libyan National Army has deployed additional troops to Kufra and closed the border to Sudan. The smuggling to Sudan, mostly run by local Tubu groups and the Arab Asuwaya tribe, will become more difficult. Refugees from Sudan could consider the route through Libya the best way to Europe. And this could be another burden for Libya. But for the time being, there is no mass movement into this direction. Let me stress, the Sudanese fighters in Libya are from various Sudanese groups. Actually, the majority is from the Dafuri rebel groups like the Sudan Liberation Movement Army, who are the arch enemies of the RSF. Their return back home was discussed, and I would say even agreed during the Cairo meeting of Libya's 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission in the presence of UNSR Badiyi and also in the presence of representatives from Sudan. It needs to be seen now how the government of Khartoum is willing to honor this and how they are going to engage these rebel groups in the light of the recent developments. Will they take them back and use them in the fight against the RSF? Or will they consider this too risky and prefer them to stay in Libya to avoid another renewed insurgency in northern Darfur? One of the armed groups whose militants have a presence in South Libya is the Janjaweed, the militia that gave birth to the RSF. So if he is defeated, South Libya will become a haven for his fighters and the Janjaweed presence there will grow even more. And if he wins, it will also strengthen his forces in southern Libya. How could that threaten Libya's already troubled situation? Northern Darfur, the area bordering Libya, 
is currently not under control of the RSF, but RSF militias were present for years in the border triangle, especially also on the Libyan side. There is information that they have left this area in the last days. The RSF is currently under considerable pressure in central and southwestern Sudan and is obviously trying to consolidate its forces. In doing so, they cannot afford to expand or to waste forces on a secondary task on border security and smuggling, especially as northern Darfur is not in their own hands. They would risk that these militias could be cut off down the road. However, as you said, depending on further developments, if the RSF is getting even more under pressure, some of the units might attempt a fighting withdrawal towards Libya to use it as a safe haven. And they could be pursued by the Sudanese army, actually, at least by the Sudanese Air Force. But if this will happen, it will also depend on how Chad and the Central African Republic will react, or in other words, if they will allow or tolerate the RSF to use their territory. One must not forget, the RSF recruits mainly from some Arab tribes, the Abala and the Bagara, who have also a strong presence in Chad and a smaller one also in the Central African Republic. Some experts said that Moscow won't let Hamidti be defeated as he is an incubator for Wagner in Central Africa and Sudan. At least they won't let him be defeated completely, maybe by shifting the situation to one of political negotiation where Hamidti will be a key player. What's your take on that? I would not say his defeat is a Russian or would be a Russian defeat. The Russians, as in Libya, are quite clever playing both sides, the rebels and the government. They have actually quite good relations with the government in Khartoum, providing most of its military equipment. On the other side, Wagner is probably present in southern Darfur in areas under control of the RSF since 2021, providing security for the very rich gold mines there. However, for the time being, I don't see any evidence for a Wagner engagement on the side of the RSF. And the Sudanese president, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, also denied that this is the case. Nevertheless, I would not rule out that in the future Russian Wagner mercenaries could support the RSF. They have enough gold to pay for them. Wagner could easily use the neighboring Central African Republic as a staging area, as they have a large military presence there. So in the future, we might see an engagement of Wagner on the side of the RSF. That was Wolfgang Poshta, a former Austrian military attaché in Libya, speaking with VOA's Mohamed El Shenawi. It's World Immunization Week, and an alliance of global health organizations have rolled out what co- what's called the big catch-up to vaccinate millions of children who missed out on shots during the pandemic. Efrem Takle Lamango, Global Director of Immunization for UNICEF, tells VOA's Carol Van Dam the mission to vaccinate children in conflict zones like Sudan, northern Nigeria and Chad is difficult but not impossible. With this big catch-up campaign, we are targeting 20 large and high uh, uh, burden countries who have significant number of zero-dose children. And we understand that uh, 40% of zero-dose children or children that remain missed are in conflict-affected zones or countries who are facing some form of fragility. And the countries that you have mentioned are only few of those countries facing such fragility. What we do along with partners, the Gavi Alliance, World Health Organization, and development partners is we try to support these countries to be able to roll out these vaccines uh, number one is through supply of vaccines to these areas, especially um, after negotiating humanitarian corridor uh, to be able to avail vaccines uh, and to be able to also work with civil society organizations who are based on ground, who have a structure on ground by providing them the required technical assistance for them to be able to deliver these vaccines. In Sudan, you don't have a humanitarian corridor, do you? Uh, in, in Sudan, we have a regular basis where we have been delivering services, working with the government. And uh, uh, that that is currently being used to deliver vaccines uh, uh, in those facilities that are functional. And, you know, this this conflict is evolving, so it could could be quite volatile and we need to adjust our uh, our approaches to be able to deliver services. But in urban areas where facilities are still functional, services will be able to be delivered using government systems. But UNICEF will be able to chip in in areas where there is significant disruption to services through availing uh, vaccination campaign sites, out uh, outreach services, and also engaging with civil society organizations that have the capacity to do so. We do this, uh, we have done this in, in the past in northern Nigeria, 
in uh, conflict affected settings in northern Ethiopia uh, and some uh, political uh, uh, you know countries which, which are facing fragility how important is it for these children to at least get that first dose what happens if they don't well this is a very critical thing because uh, we have 67 million children who have not completed their vaccinations or out of these 48 million of them never even had any vaccine so if we remain without reaching these children, it means that these children will be vulnerable for vaccine preventable diseases. This is the likes of measles, diphtheria, which used to be, and polio, which used to be history. And these are diseases that are close to elimination and eradication. If we don't do our job right, it means it's the coming back of these diseases that, will, uh, that we will not be uh, in a position to be able to respond to, depending on the size and number of these outbreaks. We have seen over the last two years period, increasing number of measles outbreaks. In 2021, we had 22 countries reporting measles outbreaks. In 2022, we had 33 countries reporting measles outbreaks. And this is increasing number of countries that are facing large and disruptive outbreaks, which means suffering and sickness for children and causes more significant mortality. That's Ephraim Takle Lamango, Global Director of Immunization for UNICEF. He was speaking from UNICEF headquarters in New York with uh, VOA's Carol Van Dam. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. A Kenyan grandfather is blaming a lack of action by authorities for the deaths of dozens of people in a cult who starved themselves and their children to death. Kenyan investigators have uncovered at least 90 bodies of people who belong to the Good News International Church. Hundreds of others affiliated with the church are still missing. Mohamed Yasuf reports from Nairobi, Kenya. Kenyan investigators are in their sixth day of searching for the bodies of people who starved to death after being told that if they died this way, they would meet Jesus. Francis Wanje rescued his grandson on March 17th, two days after two of the boys' brothers died of starvation. The high school teacher had mobilized community members and police officers to check on his family, who lived with a cult in the Shakahola forest in eastern Kenya. When I was riding there, that was on 17th, at around 2 p.m., they found that uh, uh, my, my daughter, the husband, and the mother of the husband were just there and they were holding uh, the first bone who was remaining by the time and I was very weak, already waiting for him to die and bury. So what they did, they rescued the boy and uh, my daughter, her uh, husband, the mother, disappeared in the city, the forest. Authorities in the area did not begin an active search for church members until last week. Wanje believes that if authorities had taken action earlier, the death toll would not be so high. You can just imagine that uh, things were not uh, being, uh, being handled the way it was supposed to be handled. If these people could have even moved early enough, they could have saved so many lives. Kenyan authorities have so far found the bodies of 90 church members. Another 34 people were rescued, but the Kenyan Red Cross says 314 others are missing. Kenyan authorities say members of the church were encouraged to not eat or drink by its founder, Paul Mackenzie, who describes himself as a pastor. Anthony Njeru is a theology student at Pan-Africa Christian University. He says Mackenzie's ideology has no basis in Christian teachings. Uh, it's an exploitation of people using uh, the bible but that is not, that is not uh, that is not biblical at all it has no foundation in doctrine um, you cannot take away people's rights and uh, try to say that it belongs the, the, the bible tells people to fast to death that is not nowhere in the bible his doctrine cannot be traced in the bible stephen akaranga is a religious studies professor at the university of nairobi people like Mackenzie, he says, prey on the poor and those who have not studied religion. And you can see those people who are gullible are those who are not strong in their spirit, people who do not understand much about their religion, those who are least schooled, and those people who are very poor and people who can be easily wavered by not understanding their faith truly. So you can find that these are the people who are now uh, most likely to get, uh, to, 
to, to be lured into some cults because this is not a religion. Kenyan government officials say they will fight religious extremism and radicalization of the population. Jeru says the government needs to enforce relevant laws. Generally, monitoring also and also demanding accountability, it's still good, it's still okay. We actually encourage that. We encourage also that pastors also be open to scrutiny and uh, be uh, at all times be open to their followers. Interior Cabinet Secretary Kiture Kindiki said Tuesday that Mackenzie will be prosecuted for the alleged death of his followers. He was arrested April 15th and remains in custody in the coastal city of Malindi. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Legendary American artist and human rights activist Harry Balafonte, who died yesterday at age 96, had a special relationship with South Africa. Darren Taylor reports. In 1988, Belafonte helped organize an event that proved pivotal in the fight against white supremacy in South Africa. He hosted a musical celebration of the 70th birthday of then-imprisoned African National Congress leader Nelson Mandela at London's Wembley Stadium. Afterward, Belafonte appeared on British TV's Channel 4. First of all, no event in history that I know of has ever taken place such as this where artists, and regardless of ideology and regardless of other persuasions, uh, came together in a unified way to make a statement about the conditions of a fellow human being and fellow human beings. Barely 18 months after this recording, the apartheid government freed Mandela. That paved the way to South Africa's first democratic polls in 1994, which resulted in Mandela's election as president. Teyo, teyo, morning come now, we wanna go home. That is how we knew Harry Pelafonte when we were growing up. Dr. Sipo Sitole of South Africa's National Arts Council met Belafonte on several occasions, sometimes in the presence of Mandela, who'd formed a close friendship with the American performer. Do you would think that Harry Belafonte, having been born in America in 1927, born to Jamaican parents with a Scottish and Jewish blood and all of that, he would have been just American as we know them, you know? But, says Sitole, Belafonte's music was special to millions of black South Africans because of his activism and because the white nationalist government didn't like it. When we were growing up in the 80s, we were hiding the end evening with Harry Belafonte, the album that he did with uh, Miriam Makeba, because it was banned. I remember I had a cassette of that. Had Harry Belafonte not done something uh, with Miriam during the height of our struggle, He would have been probably just another artist like any other artist that we know in America. Sitole says black South Africans recognized Belafonte as a person who understood what they were enduring. Remember also that he grows up during the height of the civil rights movement. I don't think I would have loved to have been growing up in America in the 60s. It was tough for black people, even prior to that, the lynchings. So the suffering of black people was with him, was him. So he knew this very well because he had lived it. He came out of that system and he became who he was. And I was lucky, by the way, that I met him here in South Africa. Setole is petitioning the government to award Belafonte the Order of Ikamanga, South Africa's highest honor for contributions to arts and culture. He died an activist, he died an actor, he died a singer and a composer, and he died a a philanthropist and someone who was not hesitant to speak and lend a hand. This is what we say to young people here in South Africa, that as you get this fame that you get, we don't want you to start bragging about driving a Bugatti and whatever, whatever, Rolls Royce and taking photos. Use the power, the influence that you have to change people's lives. Tomorrow, South Africa celebrates its Freedom Day and the 29th anniversary of its first democratic elections. Setole hopes Belafonte's music will sound around the land. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Baro, and our engineer, Nashwan Kali, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.